Hello, this is Josh Patel back again with another biology video. Today we will be studying chapter 13, which is the principles of ecology, and we'll be only doing the first half. So we'll start at 13.1, Ecologists Study Relationships. Ecology is the study of relationships among organisms and their environment. So as we know, everything interacts with at least some, at least one other thing. And so ecology is basically the study of how things interact. Ecologists study environments at different levels of organization. So there's different subunits in an ecosystem, and ecologists study and categorize these. Ecology is the study of interactions among living things and between living things and their surroundings. So an organism is an individual living thing, such as an alligator here. So this is our whole ecosystem, and this is our one organism, the alligator. So an organism is just one living thing. It could be an alligator, it could be a tree, it could be a bird, it could be a turtle, it could be just, it just has to be one living thing. A population is a group of the same species that live in one area. So the population of alligators in this ecosystem would be these four alligators right here. And then a community is a group of different species that live together in one area. So our community is our alligators, the birds, and the turtles. And an ecosystem includes all of the organisms as well as climate, soil, water, rocks, and other non-living things in a given area. So ecosystem is everything that can possibly in that could be interacted into the community. And a biome is a major regional or global community of organisms characterized by the climate conditions and plant community that thrive there. So it's basically a type of ecosystem. So a biome would be a forest or a rainforest biome or an ocean biome. So ecological research methods include observation, experimentation, and modeling. So these are the three basic research methods for all scientists. Observation is the act of carefully watching something over time. Observations of populations can be done by visual surveys. Direct surveys for easy to spot species employ binoculars or scopes. So basically scientists observe the environment without interfering. So they're not up in the animal's business that would change their change the animal's behavior. They're watching from a distance. Indirect surveys are use of are used for species that are difficult to track and include looking for other signs of their presence, so like remains of foods or footprints. Because you can't directly observe the species because it's hard to find them, or they're just not social enough to hang around. You can look at their remains or what they left behind. So experiments are performed in lab or in the field. Lab experiments give research more control. They can control everything that happens they basically, they're the ones performing it. Lab experiments are not reflective of the complex interactions in nature. So in a lab, you can't have every single thing that's in the real world. You can't, you wouldn't think about simulating the weather for like so a soil type experiment. You wouldn't think about it, but in nature, this happens and it changes the effect a lot. So field experiments give a more ac ac accurate picture of nature's interaction so in a field you get all the things you get in nature and you have some control field experiments may not help determine actual causes and effects so computer and mathematical models can be used to describe and model nature so scientists will record data of a certain species and then they'll eventually make a computer or a mathematical model to simulate this and for them to easy, easily make predictions. Modeling allows scientists to learn about organisms or ecosystems in ways that would not be possible in a natural or lab setting. So, or if their experiment isn't possible to do or isn't, co isn't cost worthy, you can make a model. So ecologi ecologi ecologists use data transmitted by GPS receivers worn by elephants to develop computer models of the animal's movement. So in this experiment, they basically tracked 
where the elephants migrated. 13.2 Biotic and abiotic factors. Our key concept is every ecosystem includes both living and non-living factors. And we already gone over this in like, I think it was the first slide. An ecosystem includes both biotic and abiotic factors. So a biotic factor is something that is living. So a tree, an animal, a bird, a cat, a dog, anything. So plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria. And abiotic, factor, abiotic factors are non-living things, so anything that doesn't breathe or live. Moisture, temperature, wind, sunlight, soil. It's like it can be it can be almost anything. It could be the air. It could be rock. Basically anything that's not biotic. Changing one factor in an ecosystem, changing one factor in eco ecosystem can affect many other things. So since things interact in an ecosystem, the absence of one or a change in one will all easily affect many other things. Biodiversity is the assortment or a variety of living things in an ecosystem. Rainforests have more biodiversity than any other location in the world, but are threatened by human activity. So rainforests are the, base, are the most diverse ecosystem or biome we can get. A keystone species is a species that has an unusually large effect on its ecosystem. So just like a keystone in an arch, the main it holds everything together. So keystone keystone species from a maintained and complex web of life. They maintain this complex web of life by allowing everything to flourish. So in our wetland ecosystem here, our keystone species is our beavers. So they create the wetland ecosystem by building their dam and creating a lake out of a river, which allows for many other animals to live. So this increases water flow population and it increases fish population. So it's increasing, it's allowing more animals to live here. And it also creates nesting sites for birds. So birds can also live here. And so it creates this ecosystem out of just a plain old river. And if these beavers died and nothing was able to build this dam anymore, the dam would eventually break down and form the river again and all these populations wouldn't be here. So now we're on 13.3, it's kind of hard to read, but it says energy in ecosystems. Our key concept is life in an ecosystem requires a source of energy. Producers provide energy for other organisms in an ecosystem. So producers are the base of the pyramid. And in ecology, they usually use pyramids to describe what eats what and the levels of power. And so producers are at the very bottom and they get their energy from an energy source. It's usually the sun. So producers get their energy from a non-living resource, aka the sun. Producers are also called autotrophs because they make their own food. So this is the vocab word we need to know. So autotrophs equals things that make their own food. And their autotrophs and producers can be interchanged. Consumers are organisms that get their energy by eating other living or once living things. So anything that eats something else is a consumer, which makes sense. Consumers are also called heterotrophs because they feed on all sorts of different things. So hetero, as we know, is different, so they feed on different things. So this could be a bee because it takes nectar from flowers, or it could be a mushroom because mushrooms actually take energy from a living or once living thing. So you usually see them growing on a tree or near a dead animal. They take their nutrients from the dead animal. Almost all producers obtain energy from sunlight, but there are some exceptions. So photosynthesis said most producers use sunlight as an energy source. So as we know, plants do photosynthesis and plants are, all plants mostly are producers because they do photosynthesis, take the energy from the sunlight and produce it into sugar, which they use. 
and then we get consumers that come along and eat the producers and then there are different classes of consumers which we'll learn about later and it's basically which ones eat which consumers so chemosynthesis in prokaryote producers use chemicals as an energy source so prokaryote is a simple type of cell and some of these do chemosynthesis which basically uses chemicals as an energy source so down at the bottom of the ocean where no light can reach somehow there are still animals living there and so scientists didn't know why but then they eventually realized that there are these underground volcanoes that release chemicals and nutrients into the water and these bacteria, these prokaryotic bacteria, use this energy in chemosynthesis to produce their own energy and then the same thing happens above there's consumers that eat the bacteria and it goes on and on so carbon dioxide plus water plus hydrogen sulfide plus oxygen yields sugar and sulfuric acid and if you don't know what this is it's okay because we're probably going to learn it later in biology and it's just the chemical formula for photosynthesis so they're producing sugar which is their source of energy so that's what we're going to end with on the first part of chapter 13 and next time we will be finishing up chapter 13 which is all about ecology so make sure you watch that video